right, let's see how far I get with this. And I'm going to try and explain to you what a titration is. Okay, this is what we did in class on, um, on Tuesday, where we used a burette and we tried to find out an unknown amount of hydrochloric acid using a known amount of something else. So basically, a titration is trying to find out an unknown, an unknown concentration, okay? And you're going to be reacting it with something that you know. So an unknown reacts with something that you know. Your unknown is going to be your sample, okay? And your known is going to be a standard. All right? Is not your known what you know is also known as a standard solution. It's a solution of a known concentration. Okay? It's been prepared for you to use and it's something that you know the concentration of. To make a standard solution, you need to use what's known as a primary standard. Okay? To make a standard solution, to make something you know, you normally use a standard, a primary standard. A primary standard is a substance which is um, has a few different features, and it's used to make a standard solution for a few reasons for the, having those features. One thing it has to have is a high molecular mass, molar mass. Okay, very important. Primary standards must have a high molar mass. This helps you reduce your errors in calculations, okay? It means that um, when you do go and do your calculations, it makes it a bit easier for you. What it also has to have is not decompose, okay? If it decomposes, if your standard solution or your primary standard decomposes when it um, reacts with air or something like that, okay, what happens is your standard solution will only last for a very short amount of time and its known concentration will change over time. So it cannot be, it's not allowed to decompose, okay? And it should not react with um, the air or uh, water, okay? A primary standard, once it's in the water, it shouldn't react, it shouldn't um, change once it's in there. Also, a primary standard should not react with the air around it, because then the concentration is going to change over time. So you might make it up, it might be like a molar solution, but over time, after it's decomposed, or after it's reacted with the air, or something like that, what's going to happen is you're not going to know that concentration, and you can't use it as a standard solution. So standard solutions must be made from primary standards, and that's because of these different things here. Some examples of primary standards are sodium hydrogen carbonate or sodium carbonate. Okay, these are all primary standards. What's not a primary standard? Sodium hydroxide. You're not allowed to use sodium hydroxide as a primary standard. Okay, two reasons. The molar mass isn't as high as other ones, all right? And also, this reacts with carbon dioxide in the air, okay? So after a while, your standard solution, if you make it with sodium hydroxide, it will change and it won't be known anymore. So that's what a primary standard is, okay? It's used to make a standard solution, and it must be something that doesn't decompose, can't have a high molar mass, okay? Things, and yeah. So that's what standard solutions are. Moving on to a titration. Let's look at what a titration is. Okay? With a titration, you're using a few different influences. You're using a pipette. Okay? Basically looks like this. You're going to love my drawings. This is a pipette. Okay? It delivers a set amount of liquid. Okay? These can be 5.00 ml, 10.00 mil, 20.00 mil, so on and so forth. Okay? 50.00 mil. These are accurate to two decimal places if you fill it up properly. It's got a line at the end here, so you fill it up to that line, transfer it into a conical flask. Conical flask look like that. 
okay? And these are what we use for titrations, mainly because they swirl really nicely. We don't use beakers for titrations, we use conical flasks. Conical flask. Okay, can't read my writing there. No one can read my writing in the first place, but it's conical flask, it's that. We also use a burette. Okay, basically, as I said, upside down measuring cylinder with a tap on it. Okay, it reads from zero up here to 50 down here, right, with increments in between it. You can read these to two decimal places. Okay, so here is about 2.15. Mill. You read it to two decimal places as best you can. Okay, it's hard, right? Most of the time you're guessing, but with an educated guess, you can get it to two decimal places. When you're reading it, you read what the actual number says. You don't read how much is in there. You read 2.15 mil if it's at the top there. Down the bottom here, you would read 48.12 mil, if you will. Okay, always read to two decimal places and it's called a burette. Now, what is inside the pipette, what you take, is known as an aliquot. Okay, an aliquot is what the, um, okay, an aliquot is the sample that you take in your pipette. It's a known, con known amount, known volume. What you come from your burette, the amount, okay, is your titer. The, um, the volume that you deliver in your burette is known as your titer. The volume that you obtain from your pipette is known as your aliquot. These are words that you use in titrations. Now, how does a titration work? Okay, titration works by having a simple reaction happen. What we might do is have a simple reaction between um, sodium hydrogen carbonate and hydrochloric acid. Okay, This is a neutralization reaction because what happens is what's formed is water plus carbon dioxide plus your salt, which is going to be NaCl. Let's just double check this is balanced, which it is, which is fantastic. Okay, This is a reaction involves neutralization. If we start off with one of these, with an indicator, it will be a certain color. Okay, Depending on the indicator, it will be a different color, but as you add the other one, what's going to happen is the pH is going to change. And at a certain point, the pH is going to go and change into um, the acidic region if you're adding hydrochloric acid, or it's going to go into the basic region if you're adding sodium hydrogen carbonate. Okay? This allows you to find out when this reaction is completed, okay, and it's um, at its end point, when you have equal amounts of this, when it's neutral. Because when you have equal amounts of this, you only have water as your product. Okay, so what we could do is we could have a conical flask, which from your pipette, you have a 20.00 mil aliquot of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Okay, what you'll then do is you'll react it with your burette with HCl. Okay, you'll have a certain color here because you'll have an indicator. As you're reacting with your hydro hydrochloric acid, there'll be a point when it changes color. This is known as your end point when the solution changes colour. This will happen with a single drop of whatever's coming from your burette into your conical flask. Okay, Your end point is when you have that change in colour. There's a thing called the equivalence point. Okay, Your equivalence point is when you have this being exactly equal. Your end point is just after that when you have it gone the other way, when you have it a bit further on. But I'll go into more detail about that when we get around to try and explain it. But remember, your end point is your colour change. Okay? And your equivalence point is when these two are equal. Your end point occurs just after the equivalence point.
between these two, normally anyway. All right. Now, what you'll do is you won't just do one of these because human error says you're going to stuff it up a little bit. The first one will be rough. What you'll do is you'll just um, add hydrochloric acid time and time and time and time again until you see a color change. You turn the tap off and you record what your titer will be. This titer okay, that you record will be um, a very rough titer. Okay? This will give you an idea of how much hydrochloric acid or how much you need to add to your conical flask. What you'll then do is you'll get another conical flask, another 20 mils, and you'll add in hydrochloric acid that is a little bit less than your titer. You might go about four or five mils less than your titer that you got for your first one. Because this is rough, you've gone past the end point. Once you go and add, for your second one, you go and add a little bit less than this one, that will allow you to go slowly up until when you reach your endpoint. When you have one drop, that changes the color. You'll record this titer. Okay, how much you added the second time. Your third time, you do the same until you get that one drop color change. You'll keep on doing this until your titers are concordant. Concordant titers mean within, you might have 25.56 mil, 25.9 mil, 90 mil, you might have 25.01 mil. These are not concordant yet. Concordant means within 0 0.1 mil. If you do a second, another one, 25.65 um, mil, you have concordant. You have this one concordant, and you have this one concordant. Okay? Within 0 0.1 mil of each other. So what you should do is you try and get three concordant titers. So you get three tires which are within 0.1 mil of each other. To take the average, you only take the average of your concordant tires. Okay? So you keep on doing titrations until you get things within 0.1 and you ignore the things which are outside that range. This allows you to be really precise and really accurate with your answer. Okay, so that's the basics of a titration here, where you're trying to do a rough one at the start to get an idea of how long it's going to take, and then you use your next ones as being more precise until you get that one drop that changes the colour from whatever colour you, um, your acid is to whatever colour your base is, or vice versa, depending on what you're adding into it. All right, that is the basics of titrations, where you have something in your burette reacting with something in a conical flask. Okay, your aliquot is in here. Your titer is your volume that you're adding to it. And yeah, that's pretty much titrations. The next part we're going to look at is errors. Errors in, um, in titrations. Errors mainly come from the rinsing. When you rinse things with the wrong, um, rinse things with the wrong stuff, you get an error. Okay, and let's have a look at what you can rinse. You can rinse your burette, you can rinse your conical flask, and you can rinse your pipette. Okay, looking at what we're going to rinse and thinking about what effect that will have on our outcome is what we want to focus on. With your pipette and your burette, what you need to rinse it with is what's going in there. So, in this case here, all right, our example here, we have our pipette, okay, had our aliquot, which was our NaHCO3. 
So therefore our pipette should have been rinsed with our sodium hydrogen carbonate. Okay? If it's not rinsed with our sodium hydrogen carbonate and we rinse it with water or distilled water, what will happen is our result for sodium hydrogen carbonate will be lower than we expect. That could have an effect on other things. Okay? Our burette here, because we're putting hydrochloric acid in it, needed to have be rinsed with hydrochloric acid. If it was not rinsed with hydrochloric acid, our result for our hydrochloric acid will be lower, which could have an effect on our calculation. We need to think about what effect that will have on our calculation. Our conical flask here can be rinsed with or must be rinsed with H2O. Okay, It's important to do that. If you don't rinse it with H2O, it's going to change the concentration of what's in these two things here. Okay, And you'll think about how what effect this has on everything. But let's just start off with um, one thing. Let's start off with our pipette and our burette. Say we have reaction A, sorry, a reactant A and reactant B. We have A plus B going to A, B. Now, rinsing our pipette with um, water will mean the concentration of A is lower. Okay, this is lower. And that means the concentration of B will appear higher. So when you talk about errors and what can happen, you need to say what's going to happen to the concentrations of our reactants that we're dealing with. So if reactant A, or if the pipette, which is A is going into it, is not rinsed with A, it's rinsed with H2O, okay, H2O, you're going to get less A, and therefore you're going to have, or appear to have, more B. So therefore, you're going to have a, the concentration of B will be higher than you think it would be. Excuse me. Sorry about that, my dog just saw a cat in the yard and ran into the door. Anyway, moving on. So, saying our, whatever we're putting into our pipette was not rinsed properly, it was rinsed with water, the concentration of A will have decreased, which makes us think B is higher than it is. Likewise, if B was rinsed with water and not with reactant B, it would appear that B is lower and then A is higher. It has the opposite effect. Basically, whatever is rinsed with water, the opposite will appear to be higher. So when you're thinking about errors, always you say the errors are incorrect rinsing of these two things. Okay? And that will help you when explaining and you think about what will this incorrect rinsing mean about our results. So it's what you say is incorrect rinsing and the results. What will this mean for the results? It's important that you say the effect on the results, what the errors will have on your results. Okay, that's important. Errors also are going past the end point. Okay, so you might say that in each of these um, titrations, we went too far, we went past the end point. That means whatever is in B, okay, you'll have more of that. What does that effect have on what A is? Okay, if you're putting too much of B in, all right, say we have A plus B going to AB, all right, if you're going past the end point, you increase B, you'll feel like you are increasing A. All right? You'll have more A than you think you should have. All right? Because too much of B has been added, so therefore you have more of A. This part, the errors, you might want to watch this part a couple of times because I haven't explained it as well as I should have. 
but you get the idea. You need to think about what the error is and what the error of the results will be. So what the results have for your titer. That is all about titrations. It's about the terminology we use. It's about how they're done, what concordant means, and a little bit about the errors that you'll face in terms of titrations. And just to go back to the start, the basics of it is you have an unknown sample, you react with something that you know. That's titrations. Hopefully this gives you a bit of an insight about what's going on. Again, we're going to do a whole bunch of different examples and um, a lot of different, what are they called, pracs on this. So go off and do some titration pracs and try and understand about how they work. See you later.